everybody. It's Dina. Welcome to the studio once more, and I'm really glad to have you with me to do this two-page journal spread in my Delusions journal. I was inspired by the lessons learned from doing those little tags earlier, and I really wanted to see if I could take some of that information forward into a larger spread. So I wanted to contrast doodling under ink and paint and doodling over ink and paint and just explore the properties of my materials, how they behave when it's the same materials but applied in the opposite order. So I'm using Pigma Microns for my doodling on my right side. I'm going to be doing ink first, paint second. And here I'm just demonstrating that I've got different pens, different line weights of microns, some of them thicker, and um, the ink has better flow, some of them thinner, and a little less flow to the ink. What's doodling versus drawing? So everyone's going to have their own definition, right? But for me, doodling is defined by a couple of consistent, um, consistent properties. One is that when I doodle, I am more concerned with how it feels to make a mark than with the visual result of the mark. So when I'm using a pen and I'm making a mark and I'm concerned primarily with how that's going to look, then I'm drawing. I'm not doodling anymore. The other thing about doodling is that, to me, it has a repetitive and systemic approach. So here, I'm creating a series of boxes and then I'm connecting points in those boxes along a diagonal in a consistent and systemic way. Here, I'm going to connect the points at the top of those boxes in a consistent and systemic way, creating a double line on part of those little angular ornamentations. And then I'm reinforcing that double line on those angular ornamentations again. So repetition and a systemic approach to the visual information. And again, it's really about the feel. It's about being able to draw in this very unconscious and very um, visually liberated way. I don't really care very much about how this looks. And part of the reason I don't care so much about how this looks, and I'm much more invested in how this feels to make these marks and what I learn from making a particular stroke at a particular rate or shape or distance apart, what I'm learning is more valuable to me than the result. And one of the ways that I free myself up so I can have that experience more fully is by doing my doodling and my examinations of different geom geometries and sort of geometric formulae. I'm able to do those investigations as my first layer with the knowledge in the back of my mind that this is all going to get covered up with paint so it doesn't matter. When you use your first layer as sort of a drawing practice, as a chance to jump into some zones which are less comfortable for you, by making it the first layer and by sort of mentally making a note to yourself that, oh, it's just, it's just the first layer, it's going to get covered up, this is a great way to, to increase your, um, your visual alphabet, to make your visual vocabulary bigger and really stretch it, because you'll still have that experience even if you wind up covering it up completely. So that's a really nice... Um, sort of, uh, you know, zero risk way to explore your drawings more, to teach yourself a new structure of a flower, and for example. So in this middle band, you know, now I'm kind of, I'm kind of in my areas of more competence. Like I'm actually less comfortable with some of the geometric stuff and more comfortable with these organic floral forms. So I'm giving myself a little of each. I'm putting myself into zones of less comfort, and then I'm treating myself to a little space on the page because I've divided my page up 
I'm treating myself to this little span on my page where I can just kind of, you know, f- do my little flourishes and sort of step into the spotlight and do what I like to do very well. And I find that sort of a combination approach where you give yourself those moments to really relax into your competencies as you gain more of them and then pushing yourself, dedicating a little spot on your page to doing something that you're like, I don't really know how to do this or I'm not comfortable doing this or it's never looked good when I've done it in the past, but maybe this time I'll be able to um, just do it in a more confident way and it will look better. So this is, to me, where doodling and drawing kind of start to merge together. I am being somewhat attentive to my visual result. It's not purely about the feel of things, but I'm very comfortable here, and I'm able to execute these floral images without really giving them a lot of thought. And again, it plays into that idea of a systemic approach, though. I'm limiting this organic floral drawing to this one band across my page with the intent to do other kinds of ornamentation in other sections. I'm going in here with a large Posca pen just to really deepen some of those blacks. I like to see a lot of contrast and a lot of different line weights in doodling and drawing. So I wanted to combine sort of that really enjoyable passage where I'm really feeling my confident best with something that I have trouble with. And I know it might seem strange, but basket weave and checkerboard, those are something that I have trouble executing. Inevitably, I get lost in my pattern and I make a mistake and it breaks the weave. So I really wanted to create this basket weave pattern with just little hash marks, little tiny parallel hash marks, trying to keep it consistent and trying to make sure that I don't make an error so that the weave reads correctly all the way from the left side of the page to the right. And, um, you know, the result is not wildly important to me, but just having that practice of making sure that I'm able to execute a consistent pattern that starts to bore me pretty quickly, and that my boredom does not lead to the inattention that makes the mistake happen. So, you know, it's just this little challenge to myself. Can I get through this relatively um, boring exercise where my mind starts to wander? Can I stay focused? So this basket weave is really more an exercise in mindfulness than anything else. And I like the contrast of having this sort of um, very simplified geometric next to the more organic floral band. I think it actually winds up looking pretty good. Patterns like a basket weave are really good for training your brain and your hand to do repetitive gestures consistently across a space. So if I neglect to keep the length of those little marks consistent, my pattern gets thrown off. And there's actually, it's just a very, um, a very good exercise because all of drawing involves seeing the relationships between things accurately. Whether you're drawing something very complicated or very geometric and simple and abstract, either way, you're going to encounter situations where you're going to have to mentally divide a space in half or in thirds, and little pattern doodles like basket weave really train your brain onto that kind of thinking in a nice way. To me, it's all about contrasts. So um, I wanted to do something that was quote unquote incorrect and disruptive. And in this case, 
I wanted to make marks that were wildly inconsistent with each other. So these these rainbow shapes, these scallops, they have no um, they have no relationship to any of the measurements that I've set through my doodling below them or above them. And I thought that was interesting to have a disruption. And that's something that I find really powerful is to have these sort of intentionally disruptive moments within an otherwise consistent piece. So I'm using some gel medium, a matte gel medium, as an isolation coat. If you remember from the tags, using the Tim Holtz Distress Stain directly on paper means that the stain will sink into the paper and it won't travel or rub around on the sheet. Whereas if I use some matte medium as an isolation coat, I can now lay down this transparent distress stain and I can add to it and even brayer over it while it's still a little bit wet. And you'll see that that stain travels and smears across the page. And in this case, I want that to happen. I want sort of a liquid, transparent coating of color, really nice and bright and saturated. And I can't resist that bright, saturated color. And I just felt moved to use some opaque acrylic paint over the top of that. You'll see my pen is still showing through, but the majority of the paint has a nice opaque quality. for this was to really push that ink work into the back layers. So I'm brayering a little bit of slightly wet paint over the top of my page as the paint just about reaches the point of dry. And then I can still use a baby wipe to pull out some of those orange highlights if I want them there. I like this, but I thought it still looked a little... Um, a little busy. So I used a different color of green paint to push that imagery further into the background. I'm creating a surface that I'm able to draw and paint on top of subsequently. So I really want this to be sort of flat and integrated, but have these nice little pops of orange showing through nonetheless. In part two, we're going to continue with this background and also examine what it's like to work in ink on a painted surface. So paint first and ink second. <laughs> 